Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. Engagers, we are now today in another episode with Lauren Farrow. But before we introduce Lauren, can you tell us, Lauren, if you are prepared to engage? Of course. I'm ready and I'm waiting to start. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, because Lauren has a PhD in player profiling and modeling. She is currently an adjunct professor and researcher at Sapienza University in Rome. She's also the co-organizer of the Unreal Engine Meetup in Rome. And as you probably guessed, she is mostly in Rome by now. Um, <laughs> in addition, she created the game design resource uh, Gamey Cards, which is a prototyping tool for game experience. And at heart, she is intrigued by how we interact with the world and those in it. So Lauren, is there anything that we missed from that fantastic intro? No, I think that sums me up in a nutshell quite nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. So Lauren, can you tell us what does a, you know, we, we like to call it regular days, but I know mm -hmm. sometimes that doesn't fit the, the, the schedules of most of our, our guests. But what does being in the life with Lauren Farrow look like? <laughs> it's very interesting, let's say that much. Um, I think a regular day, I, I think ev everyone in the world of game design can agree there, there is no regular day. But I think for me, it depends on what projects that I'm working on. So um, recently, I've been sort of working on a few um, academic projects and a few sort of client side things. So what that usually involves is that in the morning, I'll start with things that are a lot more complicated or complex. So if there's been sort of an issue, say with blueprints, if I'm working in Unreal, I'll spend that morning like tackling those type of things because I know that by the afternoon, you know, as all of us, we're sort of a little bit more slower. So then I will probably shift gears and, and <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'll probably work um, in something a little bit more relaxed. So I'll, I'll do reading, I'll do some research. Um, maybe I'll do some paper writing. And then towards the end of the day, again, if I'll start working again and say on projects, like I might still do some, you know, if I'm working in the modeling section of a project or if I'm doing other parts of it, texturing or whatever, like then I'll work on that. So what I, I tend to try and leave the, the middle part of the day for more sort of less demanding tasks. I'll do emails, I'll do like calls and things, and then leave the start of the day and the end of the day for things that require a lot more attention and focus. So... That's a good yeah. way to structure your day, which is already a difficult thing to, to have like very clear outlook of what you want from your from your day, right? Yeah, especially when you're, you're working with people from all around the world, you also have to factor in the time zones. So I think that's also a challenge for a lot of us. So I think in, in that structure, especially in early morning and late nights, you have the ability to also be available for people, perhaps like in Australia or in the US. So that kind of structure helps a lot with those, those kinds of things. Yes, that makes sense. It does. Yeah. So Lauren, we want to shift gears a little bit and, and mm -hmm. start by, by some interesting moments in your life. And we like to call this moment uh, your favorite fail or first attempt <laughs> in learning. Yeah. Um, a time when, you know, you wanted to do something, it didn't go exactly as you were expecting. And you had this, you know, you experienced this, this fail moment. And then, of course, how did you come out of it? Uh, maybe what did you learn from that? Can you, can you tell us that story? We want to, like, be there with you, Lauren. Okay. I like this this question a lot because I think people have such this like they have such a stigma against the concept of failure. And for me, my let's say my favorite failure was when um, I first started out doing consulting work, mostly for gamified projects. And I it was, let's say, a really interesting experience, I think, for me and for the person I was working with, where Like for us, I mean, as 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 researchers, as um, consultants, we have a very clear idea about what um, game design is or what a gamified experience is. And for me, I made the mistake of assuming um, that the person that I was working with, let's say, had the same at least same basic understanding of what um, what a gamified experience has. And um, a few months into the project, you know, we're working away, we're developing ideas, and you know, everything seemed to be going right, and then we're developing it. 
And then when it got to the, let's say, the preliminary testing, it was like there was this really awkward sort of situation where it's like, this is nothing like what I was imagining. You know, this is like the graphics are not like this and this, the game doesn't work like it should. And and when we sat down and we kind of like reverse engineered the problems and we try to understand why, you know, perhaps my vision and, and the client's vision wasn't quite aligned, I, I found out that the concept of what they had for gamification, the concept of what they had for serious games, for an educational games, for simulations, it was very, very different to mine. So I, in, to answer the question, my favorite failure was <laughs> learning this, yeah, that um, we have very, very different perspectives. And this is not like this wasn't the first case, and, and I'm assuming it won't be the last. But for me, it was a very important lesson because what I found that from subsequent projects you have to, and even if, say, your own definition is very different to, say, like another consultant's definition, regardless of that, it was very important from that point forward for other projects that you have, that you and your client or whoever you're working with, your team have the very same definitions or at least a common understanding. And, and I know it sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how many how many situations have this problem. So, yeah, that, that was my, let's say, favorite failure. Wow, that's no. very interesting. I have I have a friend who once told me um, it's already difficult for two people to be speaking and understand each other. Like, imagine if that's already challenging. Imagine imagine how challenging it is for the people to understand the same thing from yeah. that message. And that's already yeah. a challenge, right? Especially, yeah, for when it comes to gamification, because you know, at least this is my perspective, and like, no, no one shoot me for this. But when you have gamification, the, the concept is very much focused on, um, let's say, encouraging or influencing a particular behavior. Because obviously, at the end of, of a gamified experience, we want someone to develop a habit or to change a way of thinking, you know, through gamified or through to through game elements. Where, you know, in a serious game or a, a educational game or a simulation, they have very, very different principles. OK, so I think that, that having like managing this this definition, because it also influences your design approaches, is very important, especially if you want um, one, the client to be happy, because, again, at the end of the, the, the whole thing, that's our ultimate goal. And two, for for the design process to flow nicely and the end user to be quite like happy and, and that the end product is coherent and it makes sense. So. <laughs> Yeah, that, that part is also difficult. <laughs> yes, very. <laughs> it takes skill, that for sure. Absolutely. So that's a fantastic learning, like getting getting the two people involved or the two organizations involved to understand the same thing and the same hold the same expectations as well from yeah. what a project will look like, at least in general terms. Like, what is what what does it mean that I'm going to work with you and what's the product and the the result that you're expecting? That exactly. is a fundamental alignment from from day one. I oh, completely, absolutely. I completely yeah. agree. And I know you've, you've been doing things slightly different since that experience. And, and gathering from that experience, I'm, I'm sure you've had a lot of success. And we know you've had a lot of success in many, many areas and many projects. But I'd like to, for you to tell us also a story of a time that you set out to do something using, you know, gamification, your understanding as well of, of game design and so on. And you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you crafted it and, and it made sense. And it was exactly what you were looking for like you had a complete success with that project can you again guide us through that experience that you had and and, and take us you know to the ground level we want to be there with you mm -hmm, sure so this was a project that i worked on oh gosh about five or six years ago and um the core of the project was to get educators who were not using technology as part of their lesson plan so they weren't using things like smart boards or they weren't using things like um, interactive discussions and like uh, you know when you can have twitter and people can write questions and responses during a, like a class session and then you can sort of draw on that and expand upon that and this was a big issue because they the, the, the lecturers were using what was called next generation classrooms. So they were basically classrooms that were completely equipped with touch screens, with smart boards, with all like the latest technology. And the problem was is that was that a lot of the, the lecturers they were I don't want to say old, but they were sort of stuck in traditional methods of teaching. So the the ones that they, they wanted to use like 
uh, like the, the chalkboard or the whiteboard or, you know, some of them use lecture slides or maybe not at all. Like they were very much accustomed to providing lessons, you know, just like by talking. And for some people, this works fantastically. But you have to also understand that in a situation where a lot of the students, you know, they're on their smartphones or on, you know, tablets, they're taking notes on their iPads, like they're engaged with technology. They kind of, there is this expectation that, you know, lessons should also kind of adapt to this change in um, like media usage. So our job was to find a way to not only educate these lecturers about the technology, but also to provide them and encourage them in ways to adopt this technology. So uh, this was very challenging because like a lot of the, because a lot of the, the lecturers, they, they don't play games, right? So they're not really like even think basic games or basic apps like Candy Crush or, or just mobile games in general, they, none of them engaged with these things. So you have to imagine trying to get these people to play or engage in a gamified experience is going to be quite hard. So what I decided to do was say, look, uh, you know, what's what's the, the, the general demographics of who we're designing for, right? You know, you're looking at a lot of, you know, people from baby boomer generations, the 50s, the 60s. And, you know, what were the kind of things that they were interested in? What kind of games did they play? What kind of um, experiences did they have that they found enjoyable? So then from here, we, we kind of, we started to align, you know, the different incentives. So we weren't so much focused on badges or points, but we were sort of more focused on, you know, like, uh, like a, let's say a raffle kind of orient, um, like orientated mechanic or um, where they could, you know, do things or they try and present lesson plans with the option to win something like a gift voucher to have coffee or, you know, a free lunch or something at the cafeteria. And I mean, these type of situations exist in things like, you know, loyalty reward programs. But why I think it was important in this situation was because it actually aligned more with the type of, let's say, gamified experiences that they would have probably, they were more interested or they, they aligned with in a more personal way rather than, oh, they get a badge. You know, for them, you know, a badge is, is nothing in comparison to perhaps, you know, more like um, a more, the, the newer generations of people. So again, we had to try and align this. And again, we also had to, you know, give them this understanding about why technology is good. And a lot of them, we found out they had the fear of using that technology. It's like, oh, you know, it's fine to teach them what it's capable of. It's fine to teach them how to use it. But then it's, they, they were worried, like, oh, well, what happens if something breaks? Like, what happens if something goes down and I built my entire lesson? Like, how do I mitigate this? How do I change this? You know, how do I, how do I adapt? Um, my lesson, you know, if something stops working. So then we sort of had to find ways to try and ease them into, you know, without overwhelming them that, um, you know, what to do in case technology fails and make sure we provide them with all the support and all the instructions. And we, we, we managed to also implement this into part of that whole gamified, um, like app that we developed. And it was really interesting to see because also during the development process, we involved them, we like we included them and we showed them how we were developing the app and we asked them for their input and asked them whether or not that they found what we were doing was interesting or was it boring or was it, you know. And we found that by the end of it, I mean, not all the teachers were, were completely convinced or on board with, you know, adopting this technology into their, their classrooms or using that in ways that, you know, um, made, let's say, um, made their content more contemporary. But we did manage to create a dialogue and an understanding which a lot of other teachers also built upon. So I think for us, that was the biggest challenge when we had to use game thinking was how can we um, address an audience that really aren't or never grew up or never really have an experience with games like we have. So, yeah. Completely different demographics and completely different, and and that was it was a huge challenge because you can't just dive in and say, oh, let's add like a batch to this, let's add some points, you know, they'll be right. You can't do that. You have to think outside the box because also the the rewards of the badges, the points, whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily have to be digital, which in our case wasn't. You know, they'd get like a notification once they submitted their lesson plan. And then the physical, the, the incentive or the reward was physical. Like they'd get a, a voucher or they'd get like an opportunity to, you know, uh, like a competition type thing where they had the opportunity to get like a free lunch or something like that. So, 
yeah, and this is another consideration when de developing gamify things. You know, you can have a, a digital app, but the rewards can also extend into the physical realm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Lauren, I think there's a lot of learning uh, there, um, especially regarding the that type of demographic who you felt mm -hmm. was not was definitely not into games as as like more recent generations are. Um, I'm sure they're into fun and into playing different things, but that's mm -hmm. exactly the challenge that you've been used to doing certain things. And then these these professors or these teachers come up and they say, well, you know, that's not my thing. And what do you do? You have to come up with new solutions. And that exactly. sounds like a very, very adapted and great solution. And talking about that, uh, about those solutions that you create, Lauren, Is there any, you know, any process, any series of steps? What or, or what what do you do when you when you a project comes up? Like, what are the again steps? How do you how do you approach a, a project that has a need of gamification and game thinking? The first thing, the first thing, I, and I, I stick by this so much. Don't even think about the game. Don't even think about how you're going to gamify it. Throw all that out the window. The first thing I, I I really suggest people start with is who are you designing for. And this this will tell you so much. And it's exactly like what I was just saying, you know. I mean, a lot of people, you feel the need, you know, and I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, but you, you feel like you want to start designing, you have all these ideas, and, and you'll find that once you start learning who your audience are, that a lot of the ideas won't work. And they won't work for various reasons. You know, again, maybe they don't align with the demographic, maybe they're too um, ambitious for whatever reason. And I always start with the user. And even if you cannot find um, a lot of information, maybe you don't have that option for whether, whether it's because of time, whether it's because of funding, and you don't have that option to like ask more in-depth uh, demographic questions. What you can do, um, and I say this to my students too, when they're developing games or they're developing experiences that are for to be like in different um, for different audiences, is try and find as much information. On, on apps that are similar even. So for instance, say you're developing like the next gen Duolingo, okay? Find out what kind of demographics that that's targeting. Find out as much as you can about that audience. What do they like? What do they not like? And you know, you can find a lot of data, a lot of this information just by reading the comment section of app reviews. And you know, You can find out whether, you know, in some cases, and this is like I'm talking about not just on like the App Store or on um, the, the Play Store with, with Android, like also in some um, some other platforms, you have sort of basic demographics. Maybe you have the age or you have the, the gender. And then you can start to compile, like even if it's like a brief demographic, let's say like demographic report of your audience, you can then start to think about the game design or the, the gamified solution. Because, again, I mean, you, you don't want to get halfway and you've created this really, I mean, it might be, it might be a fantastic application, it might be a fantastic game, it looks wonderful. And then you find out your audience doesn't really care for it. I mean, you've wasted time, you've wasted money, you've wasted, you know, energy on something that's not going to be successful. And I think that that this this step about the user is probably the most important Of course, if you, I mean, of course, if you have that luxury where you can do like a complete demographic analysis, like you, you'd have to do it, but you also then need to think about as well, your end user, like what are the specific things you need to know about them? Like if, if you know, what type of factors like you need to take into consideration, for example, um, do they have enough time to play your, your game or gamified experience? Or are, are they required to have a lot of time available? And, you know, Besides, like these are also because you have to take a different approach to to traditional game design too, where you know you have a game and you know you can play it and you can play it for an hour, you can play it for 10 minutes. It's really no big deal. But with a gamified experience, you you wanting that user to come back, you want them to yeah. you know constantly feel like uh, let's say incentivized, right, to to continue that experience. So you need to understand what what entices them, what draws them in. And with that said, once you've started developing it, once you've included that that in that part, that demographic part into the design process, as soon as you possibly can, I I, I really like I suggest that you people do user testing, and you know it doesn't have to be completely in depth, you know QA where you know you're checking for every single bug or every single thing. Like it can be just one section of an application just to see if you know 
how it feels for the user to use? Like, do they feel that this is something that they could engage with? And the sooner and the, the better, right? Exactly, exactly. Like there, there was a project that I was working on where this, this never happened until the late stages of development. And fortunately enough for us, there wasn't a lot to change. But there were a lot of things that, you know, there were, I mean, the user wasn't completely comfortable with. And there were minor things, but there were things that we could have caught early on that could have helped to improve things like the UI interaction. Right, because again, it's still it's not just about game design; it's also about interaction design. Because you know, it's not a traditional game, and you you often with mobiles too, you're reliant completely on the UI in terms of you know that's going to be a very big part of that experience. So you have to understand, you have to know how that feels. So, I think, yeah, the the process that I would take would you start with the user try and understand them as much as possible and then influence your game design with that. Don't try and design the game and then adapt it to a user. It's not going, I, I personally don't think it's going to end well. Um, and then from there, test, test as often as you can with as diverse range of people that, that fits your, your, your user demographic. And, and yeah, and, and keep doing that. Keep as each time you iterate, like big changes, try and get people to evaluate and see how that feels. And then, yeah, and then develop, like continue to develop until you're finished. In that that way. makes a lot of sense. And especially given that you are a PhD in player profiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps too, I'm, I'm too pedantic when it comes to the user. But like, I think, I mean, really, we, we're designing for people. We're designing for yeah. them. We're designing for humans. Interact, so. Yeah, exactly. For, no, for I, now, I completely designing. agree. It was, it was just a pun. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. It's like a, a central thing. And I think yeah. I don't think there's the first person who's, who's uh, come to this section and not mentioned the importance of the user at whatever stage it is but i i do and, and, I, and i completely agree if you don't know who you're designing with you can't design so no you you're going in blind and and this actually it was another project that i worked on and they're like oh you know we have to make this project fun it has to be fun and it's like yeah but you know what you find fun and what other people find fun are two totally different things and again this kind of and this was this is actually the same project I was talking about before, where you know we we could change a few things, but if we learned early on, because we'd been driven so much by of what the the person had found fun, that we lost track of what you know what the actual user was going to find fun. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. So Lauren, um, we're going to move on now. We're going mm -hmm. to move from, from story mode into, into other types of questions. And the first one would be, is if there's something that you would consider, you know, that any gamification or game design project would benefit from or sort of a best practice, so to speak. Is there such an you know, element strategy? What, what would you say is a best practice in, in this area? This actually extends about what I was just saying. Just don't don't go in, in in with the intention to make something fun. Like this fun is 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 should be like the the result of what you're designing, but it shouldn't be what's driving it. I think with gamification projects, focus first on achieving the goals. Right, like say you know I'll come back to the Duolingo example. Say you want to achieve like someone to learn a language, all right, and you want them to learn it in a really simplistic way. All right, develop um, your application so that it achieves this and then look at how can we improve this? How can we, you know, incentivize the user? And I mean, if you look at things like Duolingo where, you know, they got the points and they got like those little badges and those kind of things and you can upgrade, you know, the character. They're very simple. It's not a lot of stuff. And I think that works really effective and it doesn't interrupt the process, the learning process. So I think, yeah, focus more on what you're trying to achieve first and then sort of look at that, adding that extra layer of, of enjoyment for the player. Beautiful. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. And in that same sense of best practices, what would you say is your favorite game? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to answer this in, in, in three ways. Um, 
my favorite game of all time would be Apes Odyssey. Simple, simply for the fact that if it wasn't for that game, I would never have gotten into the world of game or game design in general. That because, I mean, this was like what twenty years ago, I think, when I first played that, and it was just like a whole new world, right? And and from there, I, the, I would have to say then Assassin's Creed, the first one, for the simple fact that when I had finished that game. The, the amount of tangential learning that I had done from that was it just for me, that's what really inspired me and really opened up the, the potential of what games can have for people. Because, you know, and it's the same thing, like when you play like Civilization and then other games like that, where you just have that kind of that learning entwines with what you're actually doing. And I think that's really, really, really powerful. And then my favorite game at the moment, because I, I can't limit it to just one. <laughs> But is um, my favorite game at the moment, which I just finished, um, is, is Detroit. And that is just that game really, really challenges the way that you think about um, a future with androids. And I think it challenges you morally and ethically. So it's definitely something that's, that I think wow. everyone should experience. Wow. It's a very, very dynamic narrative. So. And also in, in the sense of challenges, I, I want to challenge you to tell me, who mm -hmm. would you like to listen to in an interview like this one in Professor Game? Perhaps it's a little biased <laughs> but, um, <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, Alessandro Canossa. He was someone that when I was doing my PhD, I read a lot of his stuff. And I really, like, he, he's very much more in, like, like me, like play profiling and modeling. Um, but I think he has a lot of interesting perspectives when it comes to, you know, understanding the player as part of a game design process. So, yeah, I would suggest him. We're, we're all biased, so that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay then. <laughs> if, uh, if you would have to, to also recommend a book to the, to the audience, to the engagers, who, what would that book be and why? This one's a little easier than my favorite game, thankfully. <laughs> um, I would recommend The Alchemist. It's probably one of the, the few books that after I've read it, you really kind of... It, it helps you to place things into perspective. And without giving too much away, it's basically... It's a book about this shepherd that goes on this journey based on a dream, like this reoccurring dream that he had. And, you know, it's a journey to find this treasure. But, of course, you know, like most stories, you know, lots of things happen along the way. But it's how how it's described, like how these events that happen along the way, how they described, how they've influenced the journey. And I think that, you know, we all have like this concept of, you know, I, I think for being in our comfort zone, we're, you know, we, we're used to what we're doing. And I think this book illustrates why it's so important to get outside of that, you know, why it's so important to get outside of the things that you're useful, that, that not are useful, that are, that you're used to. And um, and to really, you know, you're going to have to have bad experiences to learn good things. I mean, of course, like, you know, we all have to have a favorite failure at some point. So, you know, <laughs> I think it's really, yeah. That, it's that part of book, the journey. Exactly, exactly. And I think that, that this book illustrates that perfectly. That's fantastic. It's a, that's the, the book by Paulo Coelho, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a great book. It's a great it's book fantastic. for sure. And what would you say, Lauren, is your superpower when you're creating these games, these gamified experiences? What would you say is that, you know, that sweet spot, that great thing that you do? Uh, this <laughs> oh, wow. I think my superpower is being able to think in a very abstract way because I've played so many games. I probably spent too much time playing games. There's never but... too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's good then. <laughs> Yeah, because I think this has given me like a really good way to think outside the box that looks beyond, you know, your typical like, you know, approaches to gamified experiences because you can think, oh, you know, like, you know, this happened in, in I don't know, like this game and we could try and, you know, use something like that and adapt it, you know, accordingly because I think it'd be perfect. I think that's given me like a lot of, you know, thinking outside the box kind of um, experience, let's say, for developing gamified things. <laughs> It's a superpower for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're going to move on to this sort of gamified-ish question mm -hmm. in which the audience gives us questions. I, I have my, my role here is simply to filter if there's anything that doesn't make any sense or if, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of things. And then randomly we, we find a question during the episode and we hand you the question. So this question comes from 
Vasil Vasil. I'm not sure how your name is pronounced. I'm mm -hmm. sorry about that. Um, but <laughs> Vasil or Vasil is asking, I would love to know more about using gamification in business and enterprise software. Do any good examples come to mind? Lauren, the microphone is all yours. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is enterprise. I mean, I will be honest, this is not my, let's say, area of expertise. Hmm. Okay. Um, but um, business, I, mean, I, I know I've worked in business and enterprise things, but I can't talk about them. Um, okay, okay. I, so loyalty, you've brought loyalty. some inspiration from other ones who have done it as well. No, of course, of course. I think loyalty, when it comes to business enterprise, loyalty, loyalty schemes are probably one of the most dynamic because I have seen so many different experience, like, um, let's say, uh, different perspectives because not all of them are centered around points. You know, things are centered around, you know, the like what you buy, things are centered around like recommendation systems. Like it, it, there's whole men, like, like a whole bunch of different dynamics that are influencing these systems. I, again, probably because I, I'm very interested in the user, these type of things also, like, they, depending on also how they're designed, they can vary quite a lot. So I think, oh, God, I'm trying to think, because I'm not, like, there, there's a lot of, like, for instance, flybys. I know in Australia, that's a very nice way that they, because it extends beyond just shopping. Like, you also have the ability to get, like, other rewards. I think, And I think that's very well organized also because it's quite personalized i mean you also look at things like you know the fast food chains where I, where they have their apps and they'll have like um different types of events depending on how much you buy or what you buy or when you buy more importantly so i think that yeah those kind of enterprisal like things are quite effective um, yeah yeah those are good examples for sure <laughs> for sure and you were mentioning for example the duolingo that's a classic example Oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So thank you very much for that, for that answer. Vasil, I hope you had brought some, some of those examples and that they're at the forefront for you to get inspiration as well into the future. And Lauren, we're arriving to the end of the interview today. But before you leave, can you give us any final piece of advice you want to leave the engagers with? Um, let us know where, where we can find you. And of course, anything else you want to say before saying goodbye. And then we'll say it's game over. Okay, um, some quick advice. If you've if you're starting out with game gamified or gamification, anything like that, play games. I, I really and I cannot emphasize that enough. Really try and understand how they work. Like whether it's playing Candy Crush, whether it's Duolingo, whether it's you know playing Call of Duty or whatever. Like really understand how the mechanics and the dynamics work in games. And I, I don't mean like also play different genres play different types of um experiences you know don't just play like you know first person shooters play things that are heavily based on narrative play things that are heavily you know based on role playing and i really think that that's going to um it's going to benefit how you approach design it's also going to broaden your design toolbox let's say because it's going to give you other ways that you can develop or use the same type of game elements. Like points don't always have to be associated with actions. Like you can use points in very different ways to unlock um, parts of an experience, to level up. Because I think this is really important. I think that this is something that really need that that really helps people to expand um, approaches so that they're not all like the same. If that makes sense. So we can sort of think beyond you know the traditional uses for these things. Yeah, it opens up your mind to, to new yeah. things as well. Exactly. So, Lauren, where can you find you in the world of the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Yeah, it's, I don't know if I should say it, R3NE. It's Renzer, but we, instead of an E, it's three. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, And if you just Google my name, you'll find a lot of stuff. So. Yes, definitely. Yep. That's, just that's how we me. met as well. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. So thank you very much, Lauren, for this time that we've spent together. Thank you for providing all of these insights for, for the engagers, all your experience, all your stories, insights, and so on. However, for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Oh, well, it was nice playing. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, engagers. Thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Lauren. Do you have any questions that you would like to ask future guests? Then go to professorgame.com slash question and ask your question. 
If it is selected, it will come up in a future episode and you'll get your answer. And before, wait up, before you go to your next mission, would you like to know what does a hotel for gamers and geeks like ourselves, like some of ourselves at least, look like and what does it feel like and what is it all about? And then subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.